Shalom and welcome to Shikul Da'ad. I'm Rabbi Josh Rose. What does it take to repair broken relationships and what does God have to do with it? It's interesting, all of the Torah portions in Genesis, all of these magnificent stories of the Avot forging relationships with God, why do they take place against the background of difficult or even broken relationships? Adam and Eve deceive God and lie to one another. One of their sons murders the other. Noah and his children are caught up in some kind of drunken, shameful episode. As an infant, one of Avraham's sons is kicked to the curb with his mother. Rivka helps Jacob deceive his father so he can steal his brother Esau's blessing. And now these two, Jacob and Esau, are going to meet again. So let's leave that question in the background for a moment. Why does a book primarily about God spend so much time talking about fractured relationships? Why couldn't the Torah just begin at Mount Sinai? Indeed, Rashi cites a Midrash at the very beginning of the Torah that says that the Torah might sensibly have started with the first command given to the Jewish people just before Mount Sinai. But let's talk about the background of this powerful story of fraternal tension. Jacob, having spent the previous 20 years working for Levon and building a family, prepares to meet his estranged brother Esau. What are the last words we as readers hear Esau say before Jacob flees way back in Parshat Toldot? Esau says, having learned about his brother's deception, let the mourning period of my father come and I will kill my brother Jacob. Now that's dark. He's waiting for his father to die so he can kill his brother. We may sympathize with Esau because of the way he's been tricked out of his blessing by his wily mother and brother, but his murderous intent is known to Jacob, and that's the last thing Jacob knows about Esau as he prepares to meet him 20 years later. He instructs two messengers, Rashi says they're angels, to approach Esau, and he says, and then the Torah says, V'yitzavu tam lemor ko tamrun la'adoni la'esav ko amar avdecha Yaakov im levan garti ve'echar adata. He instructed them and he said to them, that is to the messengers, Say this to my lord, to Esau, your servant Jacob says, I have lived with Levan all this time. I have oxes and asses and flocks, male and female servants. I'm sending this message to my lord to find favor in your eyes. Okay, so that's the message that Jacob sends through his servants to Esau. As moderns, the language sounds obsequious or at least very formal to us. And yes, this is the way people speak with one another in the Torah. But maybe this formality represents something significant. The word Adoni, my Lord or my Master. Jacob is identifying Esau as the superior in the relationship as the one with authority, because of course that's how we use the word Adon or Adoni. Against their fraught background, Jacob struggled to surpass his firstborn brother and to replace him. The word seems to hint, perhaps, at Jacob's state of mind, that he's thinking about his brother's relationship to him and the way he replaced him, maybe. And notice that it might not just be merely performative, because before he tells the servants to address Esau as Adon, he himself refers to Esau as Adon. Is Jacob delving into his relationship with his brother? Or is he merely showing deference for self-protection? Either one seems possible at this point. But in any event, Jacob learns that Esau is coming towards him with 400 men. This seems like a moment of terrible danger. A military confrontation seems to await him. And Jacob prays to God and says, I am worthy, he says to God, excuse me, I am unworthy, he says to God, of all the kindness that you have so steadfastly shown your servant. With my staff alone, I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. The word here, unworthy, as in I am unworthy of all the kindness, is fascinating. The root of it actually means small, katan. And in every appearance of that word in the Torah thus far, it has always referred to smallness or lesser status or to youth. In fact, the last time that word appears in the book of Genesis is the fraught moment of deception that is at the core of this damaged relationship. Rebecca then took the, the best clothing of her older son Esau, which were there in the house with her, and she put them on Jacob, her younger, Katan, son. son. In, in Jacob's prayer, clearly the idiomatic meaning of Katonti is unworthy. 
he's acknowledging that God has blessed him and he's saying he doesn't deserve all this blessing. But the verb katanti, I wonder whether the Torah is hinting at Jacob thinking, perhaps, I have become the young one, the katan. Now, of course, he is the younger brother. But, but he's fought against that his whole life, and he took his brother's place. Now, as he prepares to confront Esau, is he accepting the truth that he's been fighting against his whole life? This truth of his, le his, his youthful lesser status that has animated so many of his decisions and actions? Jacob struggles with himself, with who he has been. He sends his wives and his children and camp ahead and crosses the Yabok River. Sleeping alone, he is visited by an angel, and they awake, they wrestle, they strive. We can only speculate when we notice that the Yabok, the river, and Yavik, to wrestle, share two consonants of Yaakov's three consonant name. Perhaps the Torah is signaling here, and I'm just speculating, that Jacob is going back over himself, that the language is suggesting a real internal wrestling. And that wrestling, the wrestling with the angel, leads to a new name, Yisrael as he is dubbed by the angel. Because he has striven, Sarita, which share, shares uh, letters with the word Yisrael, with beings divine and human, and has prevailed. Jacob marks the moment by naming the place God's face, in Hebrew it's Pniel, because he has confronted God and lived. So what does all this striving with his brother have to do with God? Why is this moment of fraternal drama also a central moment in the relationship between the Jewish people and God? One answer might be that God sets us in our place in the world. We're born in a certain time in history, to certain people, in a world whose historical and natural forces are sometimes beyond our control. So much of our lives, we fight against those facts. We try to overcome the conditions that have determined us to better our lives, to lift ourselves up. This is good and beautiful. It's the way we make the world better. And yet... We refer to God at the end of Shabbat services as Adon Olam, Master of the World. And the Talmud teaches, no person so much as bruises their finger in this world without it having been decreed in heaven. It is essential for us to recognize hard truths about our lives, to accept facts about ourselves. This doesn't mean that these facts should haunt us. It doesn't mean that we're determinists. But there are facts about our lives that cannot be overcome. Through acceptance, we can make ourselves whole and change our relationship to that particular fact or circumstance. Is this what Jacob is up to here? Well, but still, why all this therapeutic gobbledygook? What does, God, what does this have to do with God? Well, those things that are given in life, those things that we resist but at some point we must face, that those are irreducible facts of our lives, those are put there by God, the one who put the world into place and then placed us in the world. Learning when to stop fighting and to embrace the inevitable is a form of divine service and a deeply healing one at that. Now, to be clear, no one must ever accept a situation in which they are being hurt or abused or one that is unhealthy. We don't give ourselves over to hurt of ourselves or of anyone else. But when we strive with beings divine and human and can no longer find a way out, we face God. And in doing this, we can transform ourselves. Our past no longer has an unbreakable hold on us simply because we've accepted it. And this happens to Esau as well. How did he change from a murderously enraged brother to the one who embraces and kisses Jacob? Midrash Tanchuma says that Jacob sent angels up ahead to Esau. They attacked him and they damaged him once. He says, invoking his glorious family past, I'm the grandson of Abraham, let me be. They continue to pummel him. Then he shouts, let me be, I'm the son of Isaac, who was bound upon the altar. Still, they continue to strike him, and he calls out, let me be, I'm the brother of Jacob. He began to wail, Jacob, my brother, has returned after twenty years, and I am eager to greet him. As soon as he mentioned Jacob's name, the angels desist. They say to him, You are the brother of Jacob, whom we love dearly. So we will leave you alone out of honor and love for him. Give him our regards. In fact, the Shem Shmuel, a 20th century Hasidic teacher, uses this midrash to explain why Jacob's prayer to God 
way back there at the beginning of our conversation, of our podcast today, was necessary. Jacob clearly had won God's favor. The Torah has shown us previously that God is with him and that God already promised him protection. So why does Jacob need to pray again? The Shem Ishmael says, Every person is evaluated according to the place and the moment he or she faces, he says, quoting an earlier teaching. So Jacob felt that in spite of God's previous kindnesses, he at this moment couldn't rely on his past behavior. So that's what the Shem Ishmael says. So through this Midrash and the Shem Ishmael's commentary, we see something extraordinary. Both Jacob and Esau face the same challenge, discovering God in the present by letting go of a past that we too often cling to. In Esau's case, he couldn't rely on the story of his family's past, but had to recognize his brother's greatness and acknowledge his eagerness to meet him. In Jacob's case, he had to accept that his past promise did not guarantee him a relationship with God in the present. So for both of them, as for us, when we let go of the perceptions of ourselves and of others that so often blind us, when we find our proper relationship to the past and can simply see the clear light of God in the present, that's where peace and divine protection truly lie. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much for listening.